Hey y'all, thanks for joining us today. If you'd like to know more about all that happens around here at LifePoint, then you need to download our new app. It's got everything from message notes, upcoming events, reading plans, and even the Sunday set list. We hope this series blesses you. Check this out. Good morning, LifePoint. How is everybody today? Everybody's warm. Everybody's safe. I want to welcome you guys to LifePoint Church. I know AJ just did this a moment ago here at our Pine Valley campus, but uh, welcome to those of you in the Annex. If you're in the Annex, make some noise. We want to hear you. Gotcha. I heard, heard that. That was awesome. We've also got folks out in the lobby watching the service as well. Make a little bit of noise. Lobby folks. There it is. Hey, if you happen to be in the auditorium here at Pine Valley, let's make some noise for all of our locations right now. Yeah. Leland, Leland, make a little bit of noise. We want to see if we can hear you from across the bridge. <laughs> I want to welcome Leland. And I know Leland has some technology trouble this morning. Tech is, uh, man, it can be your greatest friend and sometimes it can be your biggest headache. And, but uh, we're glad that you guys are able to join us for the message. And I do want to welcome you guys today. Whether you're like, we got to get to church because we've been cooped up in this house for a week. Or, uh, or whether you just, or maybe you're like, man, I'm starting my year right. I'm going to be in church. I just want you to know that I'm glad you're here. And you have a perfect star on the attendance chart today. Isn't that great? You have a 100% attendance when it comes to church in 2018. And so I'm glad you're here. This could be your, the best sermon you've heard all year. And uh, matter of fact, by far the best sermon I've preached. So I am glad that you, we get to share this together. Those of you that are watching us on Facebook, it's an honor having you with us. Those that are on our LifePoint app, I know we've always got friends in Nicaragua and we've got friends in Kenya and all over the States. A lot of our LifePointers are still all over. Some of you are just in the comfort of your PJs on your couch drinking a coffee and I'm glad that you're able to join us. And, and matter of fact, if you've got something to take notes with, I wanna encourage you to grab a note card if you're here at one of our locations or you can get your phone out. You know, a great way to stay connected with what's happening around LifePoint is through our LifePoint app and follow us on social media. So if you want to grab your phone and be able to take a little bit of notes. So we're starting this new series called Verbs. Verbs. And we're going to be spending the entire month in the book of Proverbs. Now, why in the world do we call it Verbs? If you think about it, what is a verb? A verb is an, is an action word. That's right. It's an action word. And so what we want to do is we want to put our faith in action. I think our world is sick and tired of seeing people that say they have faith, but don't live it out. And sometimes it's a little bit confusing or maybe intimidating to open our Bibles and just say, I'm going to begin applying what I read because we don't really know where to begin sometimes. Some of you started a Bible reading plan. I hope you did. Some of you, many of you are doing our, uh, our verbs reading where we're spending one day Every day in the month of January, we're going to spend a day in a proverb. So January 1, we read Proverbs 1. Today's January 7, we read Proverbs chapter 7. Now, some of you, you started like, I'm going to read the whole Bible this year. And I would say, awesome, go for it. But I know for many, many of us, that can be intimidating. And so we want to be able to come together as a church. We're going to go through the book of Proverbs and we're going to put it in play in our life. You see, it's not about how much we know in the Bible, all right? There's a lot of people that know a lot about the Bible, but they don't do anything with what they know. That's called hypocrisy. What we wanna do is actually put in play the principles that we're learning. And so as we go through this series called Verbs, we're asking this question, God, what is the one thing that you want me to do with what I just learned? What is the one thing you want me to do with what I just learned. And so we're gonna have a great time in this series. Proverbs is incredibly practical. It will crawl all up in your business. I'm actually convinced if you read Proverbs, a proverb a day for the rest of your life, you will have a master's degree in common sense. How I many you know our world could use some serious common sense? And uh, I just, it's great. It covers so many topics and we're gonna walk through some of them. And, and so let me begin with this. I want to share with you just a few things about this series. So I've said already that we're going to be, we're going to be reading a proverb a day. Now, if you happen to miss Proverbs 1 through 7, you can read those. It takes about five minutes to read a chapter, so you can catch up by the end of the day. I would encourage you to do that. Or you can just jump in tomorrow with Proverbs chapter 8. You'll find on our social media where we're asking you, what's the one thing God's saying to you? And I like to chime in. I'm sharing a lot of my thoughts. I want you to share your thoughts. Let's talk back and forth. 
But also, we're gonna close out on the 31st, our Verb series, with one huge worship night. And we're gonna come together, and it's gonna be a blast. And I just want you to put that on your calendar. It's a Wednesday night. Don't miss out on any of this. Well, let's dive into our Verb series. So have your notes out. I wanna begin with just a few really important things you need to know about Proverbs. Really important things you need to know about Proverbs. So a couple interesting things when you read through Proverbs. Proverbs is called a wisdom book. It's, uh, it, it's written by, um, you know, there's several, there are several authors that contribute to the book of Proverbs, but the one that we hear from a lot is a man named Solomon. He's known as one of the wisest men to ever live. And so if you had the chance to sit down with somebody you considered wise, you would take advantage of that. Well, we have that privilege with Proverbs. Something else interesting to know about Proverbs is that in, in Proverbs, wisdom, Wisdom is oftentimes referred to as a woman. All right, now I got a little bit offended. I'm like, why is wisdom always got to be a woman? For instance, you see Proverbs chapter 1, verse 20 says, Out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. Why, why can't wisdom be a man? And I remembered when I was studying for a series a while back, I came across this meme that talked about why women live longer than men. And I don't know if you've ever seen any of these, but I think this explains why wisdom is referred to as a woman. Here's a couple of images as to why women live longer than men. So this guy, I don't know if he's uh, recovering from the snow of women. He's chopping out a tree with his ladder, leaned against said tree. This is probably something a lady wouldn't do. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say this is one of the reasons wisdom might be referred to as a she. Here's another one. So these guys, some of you, this, you've been there, right? You're like, I'll help you. Will you guys help me? Help me move a couch. Got it. Better yet, why don't you just lower it down? How I many you know these two, they died that day? That was it. Was it. Here's, a, here's another one, ready? So these things, these things cause death as they are. Like, I don't even, what, what are they even called? What are these called? Mary, that's not a merry-go-round. Isn't a merry, there's nothing merry about this. This is, I call this spinning wheel of death. Come on, be real. Have you ever held on to one of these? You've white-knuckled one of these things. And while people, your friends were like, faster, faster, faster. Well, this guy, he took it to a whole other level. I mean, this is ridiculous. And he, you know, he, he's about ready to try it out too. Just one of the many reasons. Here's, a, here's another great one. So this guy's, I'm not sure what he's working on, but I have a feeling I know what's about to happen next. I mean, this guy, he's like, I got you, bro. You go for it. You know, I, I'm gonna climb the ladder. No, I wanna climb the ladder. But here's the thing. I mean, as uh, as guys, we we you know we we get this we get this natural. I think it comes you know this this daring maybe act now think later because we do this when we're kids, right? So now I just want every man in here to own it. How many of you have been this guy? How many of you were like, J I bet you can't jump me. You can't jump me. Because let's just look at this. I, I'm just saying he's not gonna make it. And I feel for this guy. He's covering, I mean, this, guy, this is the only guy with a helmet. It's this dude up here. He's covering his face, but I'm like the trajectory of the bike. I don't, the, this dude's just working on a popsicle. He's like, whatever, I'm just here. I'm just here for the show. <laughs> so why is wisdom referred to as a woman? We just proved that point, all right? Ladies, we're nowhere in the idiocracy that we just took a look at. So it's just something to know. So when you read about it, you'll hear a lot of times wisdom is referred to as a woman and speaking. Uh, another thing about Proverbs is that Proverbs are, they're words of wisdom many times from like a father to a son. And so it's, a, it's kind of a dad passing along wisdom. The first day in Proverbs 1.8, we read this, listen, my son, to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. And so the idea is I'm passing along thoughts and wisdom. And so over and over throughout, throughout your reading, you'll see this, my son, my son, my son. And as much as you, you know, moms and dads, you know, you want your kids to learn from your example. I mean, you know that a lot of us, we're going to go make our own dumb, you know, dumb, you know, uh, mistakes and failures, but man, if you can learn from somebody else, it's so much better. And so one of the other things that you're going to see when you read through Proverbs is it references three groups of people. You see it talk about the wise, the fool, and the simple. The wise, the fool, and the simple. Same with me. The wise, the fool, and the simple. So the wise, who are the wise? The wise are those who seek out and listen and obey the instructions of the Lord. The Bible also calls them the righteous or the upright. Now the fool, okay, fool's kind of like a term of endearment nowadays. Like, what's going on, fool? 
You, know, you don't want to be a fool in the biblical sense, okay? So the fool, as we read in Proverbs, are those who ignore God's instructions. They're also referred to as the wicked. And so these people are, they're dangerous to even be around. Meaning if you entertain fools, you're gonna wind up paying the price. The Bible says this, you'll get to this this week. Proverbs 13, verse 20. Walk with the wise and become what? Wise, for a companion of fools does what? Say it with me. Companion of fools suffers harm. Now, I don't even have to get into the stories that we could share here at, at a, through across our church of the things that happened to you simply because of the people you hung around with. You were guilty by association. You hung out with fools and you paid the price. So there's the wise the fool, then there's the simple. Now this sounds like a good thing, like we want to live a simple life, but in scripture, the simple are considered people that are wishy-washy. They're not foolish, but they're also not wise. They're easily misled. They're easily deceived. They, They may know God's instructions, but they don't apply what they know. So when you're reading through Proverbs, I just want you to understand who is speaking and who is being spoken of. And so there's the wise, the fool, and the simple. And so I've titled this message, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. I've titled this message, Above All Else. Above All Else. And I want to preach today from Proverbs chapter 4. Had a difficult time figuring out which proverb I wanted to preach from today. And if you've been doing the reading in Proverbs chapter 4, you came across this passage. And I felt like this is a great way to begin this series and begin this year. And so in Proverbs chapter 4, here's what the Bible says. It begins with this, this phrase, my son... Pay attention to what I say. So here again, imagine a father instilling wisdom into a son. My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Verse 23, I underline this. I want you to get this. Underline it in your Bibles. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free from perversity. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or the left, but keep your foot from evil. So this dad is telling his son, I want you to listen to wisdom. I want you to fix your eyes. I want you to watch your mouth. I want you to stay the course. I want you to steer clear from evil. But the verse that stands out to me the most through this whole passage is verse 23. We underline it. Look at it again. Above all else. Will you say those three words with me? Above all else. One more time. Above all else. So think about this. He's talking about listening to wisdom and, he's, and, and fixing your eyes on the, on the right course, you know, watching what you say. But then he says this, above all else, okay? Meaning more important than anything I could tell you, the most important thing that you could do. If you don't hear anything else, whatever you do, don't miss this. Here's what he's saying, above all else, guard your what? Heart. Okay, this is interesting. You know, more important than what I hear, than what I see, the path I walk, guard my heart. Why? For everything you do flows from it. Everything you do flows from your heart. This is so important. Here's what he's saying. I want you to write this in your notes. Here's what he's saying. He's saying that what starts in your heart will show up in your life. Write this down. I can't emphasize this enough. What takes Root in your heart will grow fruit in your life. That's another way of putting it. What starts in your heart is going to show up in your life. What begins to to live inside your heart will work its way through every aspect of your life. What starts in your heart will show up in your life. And so he says, guard your heart. Guard your heart. Why do we need to guard our heart? And the reason is because there there is war being waged for your heart. There is an enemy that wants to work his way into your heart. He wants to, he wants to get a foothold into your heart. And so what I want to share with you today is the importance of guarding your heart. That, that if more important than what we see and what we say and what we hear is our heart, 
then how do we start this year? You could say this way, if you wanna start right, you gotta get your heart right. If we wanna start this year right, then we've got to, we gotta begin with our heart. It, it could be said that the, the matter of the heart is the heart of the matter. Or you could say the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. That when your heart is on the right track, when your heart is healthy, your life will work out. And so how do we, how do we identify these, these enemies of the heart? I want to share with you, there's, there's tons. I could go on for, for a couple hours about enemies of the heart, but there is an enemy that wants to work his way into your heart. And he, he has all these different angles that he works. I want to share with you just four of the biggest enemies that want to attack your heart. And if they can attack your heart, they can get you sidetracked and completely wreck and ruin your life. They'll keep you from not putting into practice what you're reading out of God's word. And you will not live the, the story that God has written out for you. So let me talk about some of, these, some of these enemies of the heart. If you're writing these down, I'm just gonna give you four. If I get some time this week, maybe we'll do a Facebook Live and we'll go through and talk about some more of these. But let's talk about these enemies of the heart. Here's the first one. This is probably one of the biggest, fear. Fear. Fear is an enemy of the heart. There are a few things in life that are as paralyzing as fear. Now, I'm not talking about like things you really should be afraid of, like, you know, snakes and cats. And <laughs> you guys laugh. You're like, Pastor, why you hate cats? Listen, the only reason your cat doesn't eat you is because he physically can't. <laughs> Every cat that is capable of eating you will. You're like, oh, look at how he sits on my chest and is purring. No, no, no. He's, he's suffocating you. So, you know, bears, another great thing to be afraid of. Okay, so I'm not saying like, you know, no fear. You don't need to go out and get a no fear sticker for your car or anything like that. There's certain things you should be afraid of. I'm talking about fear. I'm talking about fear that keeps you from trying again. Fear that keeps you from believing again. Fear that keeps you from dreaming again. Fear that keeps you from loving again. Fear will cause us to, to, to kind of plant ourselves where we are and refuse to take a step of faith into what God is calling us to do. Faith can be scary. You know, it takes courage to walk by faith and fear will keep you from taking that step of faith. Fear will say, well, what if you fail? What if you fail? You tried this once before and it didn't work out and fear will cause you to run back to safety. But can I tell you, you and I are called to walk by faith and not by sight. We're called to take risks, to take chances. I mean, in this year, 2018, what risk, what chance are you gonna take the courage to live out what God has ahead of you this year? It's gonna be your faith overcoming fear. You know, we always think about, well, but what if I fail? Yeah, but what if you succeed? What if it does work out, huh? You know, just recently I was having a conversation with a friend about relationship woes and you're like, hey, you know, maybe you need to try again. And he's like, man, I don't know that I want to try again. And my youngest, Emery, it was awesome because he's 13. He chimes in, he goes, well, you know, you, you always miss 100% of the shots you don't take. I was like, boom, roasted. <laughs> Out of the mouth of babes. I was like, that was so good. But isn't it true? Fear, when it gets in your heart, it paralyzes you. It paralyzes relationships it paralyzes because you don't want to risk again. But if you don't risk, you don't live and you don't try. You know, I think about this. The Bible speaks to fear. It says this in 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. When you feel that sense of fear, that's not of God. Listen, God has given you a spirit of power and love and a sound mind that maybe you need to write this verse down and this year you're gonna pray that of yourself. You realize there's areas you're afraid. You're afraid to try again. You're afraid to love again. You're afraid to risk again. But you're gonna say, you know what? I, I don't have, I've never been given a spirit of fear. That is not of God. What I found is oftentimes when I sense a little bit of fear, that is the enemy trying to keep me from moving in the direction that God wants me to go. He's tipping his cards. And all of a sudden I realize that's the direction I need to go. One of the biggest enemies of the heart is fear. Let's talk about the second one. Second enemy of the heart is offense. Offense. Have you noticed we live in a world that is so easily offended? Everything is offensive nowadays. You know, and this shouldn't surprise us. The world's always been a bit offensive. When Jesus was sending out his followers, he said this in Luke 17, 1. He said to his disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come. Do you know what an offense is? If you actually look at the word uh, for offense in scripture, it is the word scandalon, and it means a trap. 
that an offense is a trap. And when we allow ourselves to get offended, what we're doing is we're stepping into a trap. I mean, just a picture, a big old bear trap. When you harbor offense towards another person, you are stepping into the trap and you are getting stuck and you are paying the consequences. Offense is a trap and it will attack your heart and it's so easy to do. I mean, it happens all the time. It happens because someone wronged you. How dare they do that to me? Someone said something about you. Someone ignored you. I know they saw me. They had to see me. They just blew me off. Somebody betrayed your trust. You confided in them. And then they went and they told your business to other people. Somebody posted about you. At least you think they did. They didn't tag you, but you're pretty certain they were writing about you. Somebody's political rant rubbed you the wrong way. And you're like, oh no, they didn't. And you had a moment of digital courage where you just typed away. <laughs> Boom, take that. Right, we, we do it, we do it. And all of a sudden we, we carry this offense and we carry it from relationship to relationship to relationship. And what happens is it causes us to get a hard heart. And all of a sudden we live bitter and angry and we think that the world is like, man, they, 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 and no, 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 it's you. Stop letting everything offend you. What if you said, you know what, this year, I'm gonna live unoffendable. You know what, you do something, you, you ignore me, you say something about me, man, pff, big deal, okay? Big deal, look, my life is not defined by my critics and neither is yours. Your life is not defined by the people that walked out and betrayed you. Your future does not hinge on those from your past. Let's stop letting every little thing work its way into our heart and offend us. Offense is an enemy of the heart. Here's another one. Negativity. Negativity, stinking thinking, critical spirit. I ought to love sarcasm in this. I sometimes think sarcasm is a gift. My wife disagrees. But sometimes we get, you know, instead of saying something negative, we say something sarcastic and you know, and we get into the whole, well, you know, it's just how I am. You know, I'm just kind of a glass half empty, half full. I don't know. Last time I checked, most places have free refills. So fill that sucker back up, right? <laughs> like, I mean, let's, can, can we be real? I want to speak to those of you, like if you know Jesus, if there's been a moment when you repented of your sins and you turned to Jesus, he's your Lord and your savior on your worst day, you're still going to heaven. It's a pretty good deal, right? So even on your worst day, you have no right to take up residence in like this stinking thinking, negative mentality, the world's coming to an end and everybody's evil and blah. You know, I mean, you've seen that. You see, you know those folks. What if we just said, you know what? I'm not that, I'm not gonna be negative because, in, you know, because of my God, there's hope, there's joy, there's power, there's overcoming. I'm, a, I'm called a victor. I'm a child of God. Like there's no negativity in that. Negativity has a way of attacking your heart. Here's the last one I have time to talk about. I wish I had more to go to, to, to just unpack more of these. Number four, busyness. Busyness. I've heard it said, if Satan can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. But we wear busyness like a badge of honor. I put in 80 hours last week. I don't take a day off. The devil doesn't take a day off. Yeah, he loses. And since when was he supposed to be your role model, right? God took a day off, didn't he? Six days of creation, one day of rest. Busyness. You know what I found is busyness changes the lens through which we see the world. When you're busy, you see everything in a different light. When you are not pacing yourself, when you are not resting, when you are not enjoying life, it's kind of like, have you ever been slaving away at the office after hours, trying to finish a project? Meanwhile, one of your fellow employees is enjoying a day off and you see their posts on Facebook how dare, dare they? They're such slackers. Why aren't they committed like I'm committed? Look, it's, it's, it's rather than being glad that they're enjoying a vacation day, you're bitter because they're not miserable like you. It's not their fault. It's not even their problem. It's you. Maybe the most godly thing you can do in 2018 is take a regular day off and don't apologize for it. Use your vacation days. I'm preaching to myself right here. You're like, I rolled over all my vacation days. That's not a win. That means you didn't use them. They're there for a reason. 
You know, I remember I had the chance to sit down to some to the pastor that man I look up to tremendously years ago, and he knew I was a young church planter, and I guess we were known for this kind of entrepreneurial run, 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 you know, I'll rest when I'm dead kind of mentality. And he looked at me one day and he said, uh, he says, "You take a day off? Do you take a Sabbath?" And I was slow to answer, and so he began to fire questions at me. I felt like I was on trial. He said, "Well, let me ask you a question." He says, is murder a sin? Let me ask you guys, church, you respond. Leland, you respond. Facebook, you respond. He said, is murder a sin? He said, are there consequences for it? I said, okay. He said, is adultery a sin? Are there consequences for it? He said, is it a sin to not take a day off? And I was like, yeah. He goes, it's on the same list. It's called God's top 10. Have no other gods before me, on and on and on. The Sabbath, honor it. Anyway, it just caused me to like stop and go, but I do take a day off. I do a good job with this. I thought I did. Anyway, I'm just pushing a little bit in areas of your life to say, man, if you're not, there are consequences for not resting. You see, when we rest, we acknowledge, God, you are God and I am not. And I'm gonna chill and I'm gonna relax and I'm gonna enjoy those that are most important in my life because I know that you're still doing your thing. And when I do that, my, my tank gets filled and my heart stays healthy, you know? Jesus, he would withdraw and he would rest. I already said this, but it's on the 10 commandments. Um, You know, they're they're not 10 suggestions. They're not 10 good ideas. That maybe this year you're like, you know what? I'm gonna figure out a way to do this. I'm gonna find a way to unplug. I'm gonna guard my heart. See, when we we realize that there's an attack on our heart, we begin to, we begin to, to practice a proper defense and a proper offense when it comes to warding off these attacks of the enemy. You know, the Bible says, you can read this in Ephesians 6 when you get some time, but it tells us to take up the shield of faith. Why do we need a shield? Because there's an enemy wanting to fire arrows at you. And then it tells you to take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is why it's so important that we get in God's word so that we understand how, you know, what his word says about us and how we utilize it to fight off the attacks of the enemy. If you don't have a, you know, a copy of God's word, it could be digital, it can be in print. If you're not in it, you're going to battle with no weapon. That's why it's so important for us to get in God's word. Listen, I believe this, put, you, put this in your notes. The health of your heart will determine the quality of your life. The health of your heart. I mean, we know this in the physical sense, we see headlines of people that were in tip-top shape and they dropped dead. They looked great on the outside, but they had neglected their heart. This is true emotionally, spiritually. The health of your heart will determine the quality of your life. You will not have a quality life with an unhealthy heart. There's things you need to deal with today. So let me just ask you this question in closing. How is your heart? Don't answer this out loud. This is just for you to think about. How's your heart? What are you carrying over? You're like, new year, new you, new year, new me. No, 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 You're, it's the same you because you're dragging the old you into this year. I love new year because it is a chance to reinvent. But if you don't make a change, the new you is the same as the old you. And so what is it you're dragging from 2017 in? Is, Is there something? Is it the busyness? Is it the negativity? What is it that you're bringing in? You know, we, we have a lot of sayings, you know, we talk about having a hard heart, right? We, you know, well, you know, he's got a hard heart or you know, he's half-hearted, you know, not really committed, not committed, maybe not in the relationships, not in job, not in church, just, just mildly involved. I, you know, we say, I lost heart. You know, hey, he lost heart. What does that mean to, to lose heart? Or maybe somebody's heartless. Or they, they wear their heart on their sleeve. Or, or maybe, you know, heavy-hearted, suffering from a broken heart. See, here's what happens in life if we're not careful. We will develop soft skin Everything annoys us. Everything irritates us. Everything bothers us. Everything makes us angry. But a hard heart. Can I tell you, it needs to be the other way around. It is thick skin to where everything doesn't bother me. Everything doesn't offend me, but a soft heart. You know, one thing I learned, I've shared this with you before, through working out and um, using a lot of, doing a lot of pull-ups and a lot of barbell work is, is that when you, when you do that, you develop calluses, Right? You get calluses. And so I've got these you know, calluses all over my hands. And, and what I found is if you don't treat a callus, it will build up and build up. And you think it's doing you a favor. You think it's protecting you from, your, from you know, the barbell or, or from the, you know, the metal, from the kettlebell. 
But what it's actually doing is, is it's gonna work against you. That callus builds up. You think it's protecting you, but what happens is the callus begins to stick to the barbell until it builds up to the point that it tears away from your hand. If you've ever worked out to the point of having a callus tear off, oh my goodness, hurts like crazy. And every time you pick up something, every time you touch something, every time you put your hand under hot water, oh, it stings. Why? Because that callus got ripped away and it exposed that soft, tender, fleshy part of your hand. There's some of us, we've let calluses build up on our heart and we think it's doing us a, you know, a service. We think it's protecting us. Oh, no, no, no. Trust me, when that callus rips away, my goodness, it's painful. So what do I do? I bought this thing called a callus shaver. You can get them at your local Walgreens, CVS. And it's this razor blade. It sounds awful. And you drag it across the calluses and it shaves them down. I hope and I pray that maybe through this verb series, it's like God taking a callus shaver to the areas of your heart that you've allowed to build up. You see, you think, well, that looks like it could be painful. It's not. It's painful if you don't deal with it. Let God begin a work in you at the beginning of this year that is gonna soften your heart so that you can allow people in, so that you can allow him in, so that we can experience a healthy heart and a healthy life. If you wanna start right, you gotta get that heart right. Can we pray together? God, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the way that you God, you care about us enough to not let that callus build up. And Lord, I know there's many of us, we could go on and on about the enemies that are attacking our heart. It's different for everybody. But God, I pray that you would, God, that you would in this moment, that you would speak one thing. Maybe it's one word. Right now, church, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed across both our locations, our annex, our lobby, those of you watching online, what's the one thing that God is saying to you right now? What's the one thing that he wants you to do with what you just heard? That's what this series is about. Really, that's what this year is about. What is the one thing? Don't try to walk away with five things. Here's five things I'm gonna do this week. No, no, you won't do any of them. Here's one thing. It may be one conversation. It may be one commitment. It may be that, God, I'm gonna read my Bible. I'm gonna read one chapter a day. What is it that God's saying to you? Maybe you're here today and this is your return to church. You haven't been to church in a long time. And all this talk about God having a plan and God caring and can I tell you, God loves you right where you are. Maybe your one thing is to quit running from God. Quit running. You know, you can never outrun God. He's faster than you are. Just when you think you escaped him, he's, he's right there, not because he wants to punish you, but because he wants to love you. The Bible says that God loves you so much, he sent his son, Jesus. That, you know, we celebrated the, the birth of Jesus just weeks ago, but the birth of Jesus would be pointless if it wasn't for the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And the Bible says that we can have a relationship with our heavenly father. We can know that we're forgiven. We can know that Jesus is our savior. We don't have to wonder or question. How awesome would it be if the very first Sunday of 2018, you made a decision to put your faith and trust in Jesus? Can I tell you, you can do that no matter where you're seated here at Pine Valley or at Leland, watching online, you can make this commitment right now. I want you to know that if you would acknowledge, admit that you are a sinner in need of a savior, that's just true of all of us. When you come to the understanding that what Jesus did on the cross, he did for you, then what you do is you, you repent of your sins. You acknowledge, you say, God, I am, I'm sorry for what I've done. I'm admitting it and I am leaving it and I am leaving my life of sin and I'm turning to you, Jesus. What you did on the cross, you did for me. And if today, if you've never made this decision, would this be your moment when you say yes to Jesus? Right now with heads bowed and eyes closed, I wanna give you a chance to say yes to Jesus. Would you make this your prayer from your heart to the very heart of God? Dear God, I'm choosing today to put my trust in you. I repent of my sins and I turn my life over to you. I put my trust in Jesus. I believe that his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead 
is proof that He is the only way. And I choose today to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of my life. I'm asking you to save me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me the strength to live for you. Say this, say thank you for saving 